fixed again. Let me know if any issues come back up again. It was the form made easy. I think that closed the 4.0. So look back in there. It should be working again. Okay, and if it, something goes awry over the weekend, um, let me know. Okay. Oh, there was something else. My clinical group that's going to be starting on Monday, whoever you are, wait after class to meet with me, okay? I need to tell y'all something. Um, I've uploaded a few things in your content folder. I wanted you to see as we go through this um, module. So down here, the, there's, a, there's a few links that, that were in here already I really want you to make sure you look at. Don't neglect to watch this ABG video. Okay, we're just... It is the bomb, okay? Well, the YouTube link, as you see, is still active. It is excellent. There, as I said on Tuesday, there are ABGs on this test. And you will be required to determine what those values mean and potentially what causes those values and what we do to fix those values. Okay? Because this content is building on 105. So make sure you've brought that forward. I love this little tutorial because if you're a visual learner like myself and if you have to have everything organized in your brain like I do, this really works, okay? And it was a very appealing method to me. If it doesn't work for you, find your other resources from 105, okay? Because you can use the wrong method as well if you would rather do that. It doesn't matter to me. Um, as long as you can interpret them, okay? So it's a very short tutorial. If I were you, and I was doing this and I wanted a refresher, I would start the video and use that first set of ABG values he gives you and I would pause it. And then I would try to interpret those values and then I would restart the video to see if I was right. And if I wasn't, I would listen carefully as to what he's trying to explain to you why it wasn't correct. And then I would do the second one and then the third one. In the course, there are at least three practice ABG sets. At least three. So if you look, ABG passes, ABG, ABG, and these have the, the answers later on on the worksheets for you. Use them, practice them, that's what they're there for, okay? Just some generic things you might want to see as far as terminology. Now, down here at the bottom, I've added two things. Um, we discussed, well, we're going to discuss them in more detail here, but why we use paralytics. If you've been in clinical already, You've already had this discussion, okay? Uh, but now we're in Module B, we're going to talk about paralytics and why they're used. And this is a, a, an assessment method we would use for a patient who is receiving a paralytic. So you're going to need to take some time to read through this article because it explains to you what is a train of four. And you don't, by the way, you'll hear it used, the term erroneously, multiple times in a clinical setting. You'll hear nurses refer to it as train of fours with an S. There is no S. It's train of four. Okay, what is that? What does that mean? Why do we use this device for a patient who's on a paralytic? So that's one thing I've uploaded in here. And then a RAS score. This is one of the ways when we're looking at a level of sedation of a patient. You know, everything we do, we, we need a quantifiable way to measure that. And so this gives you a score that we can actually score a patient's level of sedation. Okay? So, these two things are in there just to kind of help you understand when you hear these terms, we talk about a train of four, we talk about a RAS, what kind of patient would I use that score for, et cetera. Okay? So those are in there and they are ready to rock and roll. All right, let me get to this. <coughs> Any questions before we get started though on stuff like this? So I told you, don't do yourself a disservice that you, you know, take time to go ahead and listen to that Module G presentation, the one, one hour and 35 minute. As you know, it's a farm heavy course, so make sure you're paying attention to the pharmacology because your NCLEX is pharmacology, isn't it? It's one of the biggest things we do as nurses. So let's make sure we're competent with the pharmacology. So um, pay attention to the medications that I've already talked to you about on Tuesday. Use the nursing process to prepare for Module G. If you had a patient who had a paranoid uh, or personality disorder, just that's the first thing that came to my mind, um, what would you expect to find on an assessment? What is your priority concern for this patient? What do you want to see achieved? How are we going to get there? And how do we know that that happened? Okay, it's nursing process is all that is. So it's a good way to prepare for that. 
There are, I say one more time, there are module G questions on the module B test. Okay? So make sure you don't ignore it. But obviously, the heavier weights will be placed on module B. Okay? Okay, any questions before we get started? So, what were some of the things I had to do for homework for this module? Review the question for That's right. Review what are the processes involved for adequate gas exchange? What? Do you got you a double duo going on over there, Dad? You got two of my favorite players. I got three. <laughs> uh, uh, the, lim the, the limoncello is my favorite. Yes. Um, so we talk about the physiological processes that end up creating a successful gas exchange process. What are they? So we talk about the mechanics of ventilation, which would be involving what? When I'm talking about mechanics, what am I referring to? What mechanical things have to happen? Okay, but I, my, my chest has to rise and fall. With that rise and fall, what has to move up or down? Diaphragm. Diaphragm has to move up or down. So I have to have a compliant chest wall, and I have to have a diaphragm that can function. Okay? What what other mechanism must be intact in order for the gas to actually be exchanged? What do we have to have flowing? Blood flow. We have to have adequate blood flow to the lungs or we don't have adequate gas exchange, right? Because isn't it true that's where those molecules are carried? Okay, so we've got to have the perfusion part to have adequate ventilation achieved. So as we go through this and you're studying for this test, make sure you don't forget there's a vascular involvement in an actual adequate um, gas exchange process, okay? So um, I'm organizing these in groups, if you will. So we've got pulmonary edema. What kind of patient have we already discussed that's very prone to pulmonary edema? In a prior module, left ventricular failure. All right, that left ventricular failure patient. What about a patient with severe mitral stenosis? Are they at risk for pulmonary edema? Yeah, not for the same reason the left ventricular failure of patient is, but a severe mitral stenosis patient is at high risk for pulmonary edema. Why was that? Because fluid's backing up. We have run out of room in that atrium with the mitral stenosis, then it's backing up to the pulmonary bed, okay? So once again, guys, you're gonna to have to go back to module A and review that module A as well. Okay, because all this stuff keeps building on itself. We're going to talk about, and we talked briefly in Module A about there's a renal failure patient that would be predisposed to pulmonary edema, right? What, why is the renal failure patient predisposed to pulmonary edema? In layman's terms. Filters aren't working. If I was talking to a patient, your filters aren't working. They're not pulling fluid off the body. You know, kidneys essentially are, right? I had a patient yesterday that pulled 32 liters on yeah. That's a lot of water. And he lost, I think they say 90 pounds. That's what I say. If it was that much fluid, he's lost it. Because each each 500 milliliters is about a pound. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of water weight. Okay? So we know the renal failure patient. We know that simply giving IV fluids too fast can cause those barrel receptors in the vessels to act up. And then all of a sudden we have fluid extravasation and pulmonary edema, right? That's, that's not as common, though. Most most healthy people can compensate for that volume and are okay. We know hepatic failure patients for a similar reason to our renal failure patients. We're simply not pulling off fluid, right? We have poor lung retention, whatever. But we're also going to add with this discussion the patient with ARDS. So when we get to the adult respiratory distress syndrome, we're going to talk about this is one more patient we're going to add to our group of patients that are predisposed to the development of pulmonary edema. So what is pulmonary edema? How is it different? Go ahead. Okay, so what I want you to keep in mind, you guys, and I see where students get really confused on this. So let's go back to what are we listening to when we listen to lung sounds. If I'm hearing a patient wheezing, there's two processes that would create that sound. What are they? What's one of them? Okay, a, a narrowed airway uh, due to what was a common reason for a narrowed airway? Asthma. Okay, so an asthmatic and inflamed airway. Same, same thing would happen to a patient with an inhalation burn. Wouldn't it be an inflamed tight airway because it's edematous, okay? 
So we have a tight airway. What's another cause of a wheeze? What about a patient with pneumonia and they've got some really tenacious secretions? If that secretion partially blocks an airway, isn't it going to cause a wheeze? Yes. So I have my patient cough. Which of the two physiological causes of a wheeze is going to clear with the cough? The secretions. Because if it's a tight airway, it's not going to clear with the cough, is it? It's going to stay just as wheezing as it was before. So we know that, in other words, they both resulted in the airway being tightened. One is due to a foreign body, like a secretion, and the other is due to a tight airway. Why is it important as a nurse that I understand what caused the wheeze? Why does it matter that I know? Because I've got to be able to know what an appropriate intervention would be. Is a fluid volume bolus going to help my patient with asthma? No. no. That patient needs steroids. We need bronchodilators. Whereas the fluids could indeed help my patient with thick tenacious secretions, couldn't it? It's going to keep those secretions liquefied and help the patient get them up a lot easier. So knowing your cause is crucial to knowing what would be appropriate, okay? So then we go into the what we sound we call bronchi. What are bronchi? What do they sound like? Obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> We've got musical kind of sounds. They're, they sound junky is the word we use. Un don't document junky. <laughs> okay? But if you're t talking to another nurse, you say, they sound junky. We know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay? Don't put junky in a documentation in a car, chart. They sound junky. There's a lot of secretions. It's the mucinex dude. Do y'all remember that commu commercial? The mucinex little <laughs> gross little green booger looking things? Okay. It's the mucinex dudes. There, there are secretions everywhere. And typically a patient with a lot of bronchi has an infectious or an inflammatory process going on. We have an end waste product in the lungs that needs to be cleared with what? Good forceful coughing. Turning a patient, keeping those secretions mobilized so we can get them out. Keeping them liquefied. So the patient can, who doesn't have a good forceful cough, get rid of those things, okay? Now what are crackles or rails, as we used to call them? What does it sound like? Pierce, you're going to have to borrow somebody's hair. If you take hair and rub it next to, y'all do it. Those of you that can, sorry Josh. Take your hair, <laughs> you hear that? Those are rails. And that's what that sounds like, guys. Um, with permission, <laughs> later you can borrow somebody's hair, okay? <laughs> Don't make us grab people's hair. <laughs> Those are rails, crackles. Now, what do they embody? What do they represent? Fluid. Okay. Now, don't get confused with where the fluid's located. When we're talking about those secretions, those ronchi, they're actually in those passageways, okay? They've come from something that was injured in the lungs, like pneumonia, and we've got that waste product, just like if you had an infected wound, wouldn't you have some waste product there? Okay, but now it's inside, I can't see it, but I can hear it. Rails, crackles, are fluid in the tissue of the lungs. So similar to your patient who has an edematous leg, the fluid's in the tissue there, isn't it? So when we're talking about rails, the fluid is in the lungs. Think of, it, think of them as sponges. Okay? And there's fluid within that sponge. Now, isn't it true that my sponge can become so saturated that there's still fluid around it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so sometimes you'll see that fluid actually spilling into that bronchial tree. But typically, rails will not clear with a cough because of where it's located. Okay? We have coarse crackles, meaning, man, we got a lot to what to inhale or we can have you know, little fine crackles. Where are those sounds going to begin? Where's the first place I'm gonna hear the crackles? The Why the bases? Because fluid is heavier, air is lighter. So because we are erect, or even if we're laying in our bed, we're still head up, fluid's gonna settle in the bases. Which bases, posterior or anterior? Posterior, posterior because people are laying back. So what does that mean to you? That means if you, as, and again, remember, what sets apart your scope of practice from every other discipline is your ability to analyze the data. What does this mean? What am I gonna do with it? 
And when you analyze data, one of your anal analysis is that you're performing when you walk in a patient's room is what is this patient at risk for today? What are my actual problems? What are their risks? And which one is number one? Because when I can ascertain this patient's at risk for this, then what can I do about it? I can start monitoring for it right away. And I know that if I've got a patient at risk for pulmonary edema, I'm going to start listening to the bases right away. Because we don't want to wait till it's too late. Okay, so as we talk about pulmonary edema, make sure you really understand what we're talking about, where the fluid is, etc. So, how does a patient present when their gas exchange fee starts to become compromised? What's one of the first things we know? The brain is super sensitive. So we're going to start seeing that anxiety, that apprehension, that agitation. We're going to start having some tachypnea, orthopnea, increased work of breathing, nasal flaring as it gets worse and worse and worse. We have tachycardia. Why would, why would a patient like this become tachycardic? Because we got sympathetic stimulation, the body detects, hey, we gotta circulate some more oxygen, how can we fix that? Well, we can increase the rate at which we de deliver that, and thus that's what it's gonna try to do, okay? Later, later, with that pink frothy sputum, and often you'll see that when they intubate the patient. They put that endotracheal tube down, and it looks like somebody took a strawberry can soda, shook it, shook it, shook it, shook it, shook it, and popped the top. It's pretty impressive. You're like, well, and that's when that sponge if so full, we've spilled into it, to the airways now, okay? That's what you're seeing. Way behind the law ball game, aren't we? We should have addressed this a long time ago. Why do we wait till this patient is drowning in their own secretions? Let's not let that happen. So what are we, how do we diagnose that? Well, of course, we're going to chest x-ray, aren't we? By the way, if I have a, and, and no, you're not going to be required to read chest x-rays at a, um, pre-licensure level, you're not going to be required to read chest x-rays unless you're in advanced practice, but you do need to have some common sense when, you, when you're when you reviewing them, okay? If I'm looking at a chest x-ray and I see an area of uh, as whited out in an upper left lobe, is that fluid? Yes or no? Think about it now. It's in the upper left lobe. It can't be. How's it possible? I mean, what's suspending it there? Fluid is heavy. It will fall. So what is this instead? Secretions or a mass. Okay, because the x-ray as it turns wider represents there's a density here. Water's dense, fluid's dense, blood is dense, but so are masses, okay? So it's representing a density, okay? So you common sense would tell, okay, this isn't this. So they're looking at chest x-rays to determine what do we got going on here. ABGs, we get a baseline gas exchange value. Basic metabolic panel. Why do I want a basic metabolic panel? What am I looking at here? Potassium. Uh, good job, Juan. Potassium. Why do I need to know what potassium is? No. That's right, because we're probably going to get some diuretics. And I need to know what my baseline was before I ever give that, okay? And then uh, CBC, why do I want a CBC? That's right, H and H. Let's look at our oxygen carrying capacity. Now, your BNP is how medicine can quickly discern, is this cardiogenic pulmonary edema or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? If the BNP is normal, you have non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So there's no reason to put this patient on but dobutamine, for instance. That's not gonna help them. Whereas if I've got an elevated BNP, which represents left ventricular failure, but WDB might be a really good drug right now. Okay, so your BNP helps them discern. What hemodynamic value, did we talk about module A? And yes, you will see hemodynamics on this test, was very specific to cardiogenic pulmonary edema. CBP gives me overall fluid volume status. That's a great number for this but what number gave me specific information regarding the wedge pressure? That's right, y'all remember that wedge pressure? Because the wedge pressure is measuring what? How much fluid volume is at the pulmonary bed. Now, if you've got a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema patient, your wedge pressure is going to be normal. Because it's not related to a backup. 
okay. There's all this fluid on the lungs, but it's not because fluid backed up to the lungs. So your wedge pressure and your BMP will be normal in a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema patient. So these are very good diagnostics to help us figure out which way we need to go in terms of treatment. Um, again, I, I can't stress to you enough, it's much easier to go ahead and prevent this than it is to treat it. Um, these people get sick really fast. So how about let's just be on our A game. And again, once again, if I don't understand who's at risk, I don't apply that information, then I can't possibly determine if they're developing pulmonary edema because I wasn't assessing for it in the first place. So I gotta know who's that person I'm going to assess this for and then go from there, okay? So we're definitely gonna need some, even though, and now don't, don't get confused and think just because it's a preload reducer that we're treating cardiogenic. A diuretic is also a, just pulls fluid off, doesn't necessarily always have to reduce preload, does it? Okay, so for the cardiogenic patient, it's an awesome preload reducer. For your non-cardiogenic, it's still gonna pull fluid off. It doesn't care what put the fluid there. It's just, I'm gonna do my job, I don't care what, why y'all did it, okay? If it is cardiogenic, we may need to reduce afterload, right? Y'all remember that? Why do we reduce afterload for a patient with left ventricular failure pulmonary edema? What does afterload represent in one word? Resistance. resistance. Okay, so if I reduce resistance, what am I preventing? We're preventing the fluid from backing up. We're allowing it to go forward because we have less resistance, okay? But would an afterload reducer help a patient with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? That's not the problem. So why would we do that? You follow me where I'm going? Diuretic would be applicable in all those situations. But an afterload reducer is gonna help your cardiogenic, not your non-cardiogenic, okay? So I, would, I wouldn't expect an order for an afterload reducer. So medicine's gonna figure out what caused it. Because I, I can't, can't treat it appropriately if we don't know what caused it. Oxygenation is a priority. We've got to get oxygen on this patient. We've got to restore that oxygenation status. Um, we've got a list of drugs here. We talked about morphine in module A. It's a afterload reducer, so therefore it also indirectly reduces preload, but the primary re reason we use it for your um, pulmonary edema patient is it decreases the work of breathing. It also has a nifty little side effect of relieving a little anxiety. <laughs> they're scared, okay? They're, they're they're pretty scared. So morphine's a really good drug here. And remember, one of your criteria is, one of the criteria that you would evaluate before you give morphine? Respiration. Well, how do you think this patient's respiratory status is? High. So it's not going to be a problem. <laughs> we're not breathing eight times a minute. Okay? So we're going to be okay. Your vasodilators, again, your afterload reducers will be appropriate for that patient with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Your dobutamine, again, for your cardiogenic pulmonary edema patient, not my non-cardiogenic. Ditch, again, pulmonary, I mean, a cardiogenic and middle renal pulmonary. A ditch, a cardiogenic, okay? So understand why I would use which one when, okay? Diuretics, everybody. Oxygen, everybody. Morphine, pretty much everybody. All right, so what am I gonna do? Be prepared that you're gonna have to, we're gonna have to intubate the patient. Because it's gonna be between their increased work of breathing, and they're gonna be so fatigued, exhausted, trying to breathe that there's gonna be a point where they're not able to successfully manage their gas exchange problem anymore. That we're gonna to have to intubate them so that we can help them manage that, okay? So be prepared to intubate. Um, obviously, why would we wanna maintain the bed at high fowlers? What does high fowlers do for you in terms of your lungs? Full expansion. We need full expansion, and that's why we have high fowlers, okay? Also, fluid is a little lower, so maybe we can optimize some of that upper airway to keep them clear. Now, y'all know, we told you this when you were fundamentals, there are no excuses for bad nerves at a patient's bedside. It ain't about you. If you don't have the ability to make cool and collected and calm at the patient's bedside, this is not gonna be for you. Okay? A patient, your license says that you can take care of a patient. You can't run out of the room because you're having your own moment of fear. You're inside, you're gonna be trembling. Okay, and that's normal. You should be a little worried. I'd be a little concerned about you if you weren't. <laughs> I, I know, hmm. 
we're not robots, we're human beings, but inside. Outside, you, your patient is depending on you to keep your act together. So when I'm taking care of this patient, I'm going to stay calm. Now that doesn't mean I just lack the days go walk in and out of the room like no big deal's going on here. They do need to see that you have a sense of urgency too, that they know that you're actually concerned and turned enough to take good care of them, okay? But you're going to stay calm at the patient's bedside. And, and what I'm going to do for these patients, I'm going to tell them everything I'm doing. This medicine I'm giving you is going to take some of this fluid off your lungs to help you breathe easier. This mask is going to deliver more oxygen for you and help you not have to work so hard. This tube we're going to put there on your trachea is going to help you rest and it's going to take care of your breathing for you while you heal. But you're going to keep your voice calm and you're going to stay in the room with the patient. Don't leave somebody that's in distress, okay? Because that's going to worsen the situation, isn't it? And whatever you do, don't tell them to calm down. And don't tell them to slow their breathing down. That's physiologically impossible. You're trying to tell the sympathetic nervous system not to do its thing, or you feel over that. But you being calm can help your patient stay calm, okay? I, there was a cardiologist I worked with, Dr. William Hood. He was the governor of the Board of Cardiologists in the state of Alabama. He was a very intimidating, tall, intelligent man who taught our other cardiologists at UAB. But when he, and he always did this thing with his stethoscope, there's not beginners. And I always wondered, I thought one day I'm going to come in here. Oh, I, okay, I don't ask what to do this gizmo because I have no idea. I know you listen to fetal heart something with that, but we ignore this, okay? I don't use that. Let's just pretend it's a regular stethoscope. He would walk in and he'd have a stethoscope in his carotids. That's how he carried it. Instead of like most people, <laughs> right here, I thought, how's he still getting perfusion to his brain? <laughs> but anyway, he would walk in to a code or, or a situation about the code or whatever. And everybody, you know, all this case, and all of a sudden he's like, how much effie have we given? Okay. Have we given any lidocaine? Yes, sir, one more round. And everybody was all of a sudden, same code, same intensity, same urgency, but in a calm state. And it was very effective. That's what happens in chaos. Everybody's trying to yell over everybody else. Everybody knows, nobody knows what anybody else is doing. You are required by your license to take care of a patient. It's not about you. Therefore, you're going to keep that inside voice inside. You're going to stay calm and you're going to help your patient. That is your requirement by licensure, okay? Because they know they are dying and they're terrified, okay? They don't need you terrified too. Now, you may go to the bathroom later and vomit. Go ahead. Okay? Your knees may feel like jelly. There have been plenty of times in my career I've thought, I don't know if I can keep standing up because they're pretty wobbly right now. I don't feel good because they're like, yeah, shake it on the inside, not on the outside. Okay? What hemodynamics am I going to monitor? Wedge pressure. What else? CVP. Because CVP is giving me that overall circulating volume, isn't it? And isn't that a really good number right now? Okay. Vital signs, that goes without saying. How often do you think you're checking your vital signs right now? You might be doing it every minute. It depends on your situation. Okay? And then strict, 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 I know. Now, we're talking about, you know, a urometer on your Foley bag. Every milliliter of drug you push, you're, we're talking about strict, I know. How much fluid volume have we given this patient? Okay? Nursing management. So these are those drugs, and I want you to create an active learning template on. Don't don't do the pancuronium and the rocuronium separately. Do them on one. You can. If you've already done them separate, that's part, that's fine too. Because what does the suffix tell me? What kind of drug is this? Those of you that are working in clinical, what kind of drug is this? A paralytic. If it's got that onium, you've got a paralytic on board. Okay. Now, what are some nursing considerations for a paralytic? And first of all, why would we give a patient who's been intubated a paralytic? Go ahead, think, Josh. They're intubated, and I've given a nail on a paralytic. Why? Okay, Chloe. Where's my Chloe? Chloe. So they don't extubate That's right, so they don't extubate themselves. Mm -hmm. We can't take the chance that a patient will remove any life-saving equipment. So we're going to have chemical and physical restraints. 
Now the chemical restraints also, when I, when I paralyze the patient, in addition to preventing any ac accidental extubation, what else am I allowing the body to do? Wow. Completely relax on it, let this thing do its business. This is, you can do this if you want to, but don't say I told you to, it's up to you. But get a big old slurpy straw like um, Janae has got over there. Get a big old slurpy straw at home, fix your mouth around it and cl clip your nose shut and breathe exclusively through that big old slurpy straw. And you tell me if you feel like you're getting up air. I guarantee you're gonna say, oh, heck no, I took the pin off my nose and took that thing right out. It's scary. They're scared. Not to mention the fact that we're blowing air in as opposed to the normal mechanism of respiration, which we're gonna go over in just a minute. So we need them to not fight it, because it would be natural to want to buck against that pressure, okay? So I'm gonna paralyze them, but what must I keep under careful consideration at all times when I've got a patient receiving a paralytic Tyler, do you remember what that was? What's something I need to assess for that they're gonna be incapable of communicating to me? That's exactly right. Just because they're paralyzed doesn't mean they don't feel. Have y'all seen that movie? Um, Gerard Butler. Law of Autism. Yeah, Law of Autism. <laughs> y'all seen that movie? Okay, he, he, uh, Gerard Butler gets the bad guy. Is it Jamie Foxx? Yeah, Jamie Foxx is the, the DA. He gets that bad guy that murdered his wife and daughter, like a puffer fish, and poisons him, which paralyzes him. And then he proceeds to dismember the guy while he's paralyzed, but feels every bit of it. Remember that. If you forget what paralytics do, remember that movie. That was his intent. His intent was to paralyze the guy by making sure he could feel everything as he methodically dismembers him while he's alive. It's not like having surgery, guys, and feeling every part of your procedure, but incapable of moving or speaking. Think about it, okay? So when you're a nurse and you've got a patient on a paralytic, don't be ignorant and assume that they're not in any pain. They still feel, okay? And we need to be cognizant of that and look for the signs and symptoms of pain when a patient can't verbalize pain or can't do any facial expression that would let me know they're in pain. What would be some signs and symptoms of pain? Blood pressure going up, what else? Some of them move their legs or can't move anything. Oh. Okay. Can't move anything. Um, heart rate's going to go up. Are they going to become diaphoretic potentially? And then you also put the history together. If this is an MVA patient with 15 broken bones, they're in pain. I don't think it right. So think logically through your sequence. What have they had? Have they had something recently happen that's going to have that they're going to have pain? The exploratory lap. Whatever, okay? So use your critical thinking. Now, propofol and dexmedetomidine, what type of drugs are these? Sedatives. Sedatives, okay? What's the key difference? And again, if I were you, now, you can do one, if you wanted to do one um, active learning template for the top two, that, that's up to you. It would be very helpful to you to group those as, as a paralytic group. Um, you do need to do separate ones for propofol and dexmedetomidine because there's, there's a key difference between dex and propofol. Um, Okay, propofol short acting, so it's great when we need to do a neurological assessment because once a shift, I'm required to do a neuro assessment. So I can taper my propofol back down, my patients don't wake it back up again, do my neuro assessment, I can titrate back up, my patient goes back night night very quickly. But what's the big difference between when would I use DEX and when would I use propofol? Well, what happened to Tyler? If I'm trying to wean them off the ventilator, which one is the preferred? If I still, if I'm a patient is still agitated, I need to keep them calm, but I don't need to depress respiratory function. Which one is my go-to? Dexmedetomidine. So when you're in clinical and you've seen this use of these different drugs, you'll understand why. Propofol has a profound respiratory depressant effect, so it's not exactly an ideal drug when trying to wean somebody off the ventilator that still needs some help with their, you know, to relax. At higher doses, they're not going to be able to breathe if you want them to. Whereas dexmedetomidine doesn't tend to have the profound respiratory depressant effect, but also keeps my patient calm. Okay? Trust me when I tell you, you better know your medicines. Okay? That's a hint. All right, so here's your pulmonary edema patient. Again, you're not going to be required to, uh, there will be no x rays on this test, okay? Because it's not pre licensure. But just, let's just look at it for a minute. You see the widened out areas? 
Remember, whited out areas, all that does on x-rays tells us there's something here. It doesn't say what it is. It's like there's a dense mass here that's not air. So if I look, I see ribs, right? I see the diaphragm, I see the cardiac silhouette, but then I see this little hazy stuff. What is this? What does this represent right here? If I were listening to this patient's chest, what would I expect to hear here? Yes, crackles. What would I expect to hear up here? Far fewer crackles, essentially clear. Okay, so we know again fluid cells. So ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome, is one of those things that can cause a patient to develop pulmonary edema. As a matter of fact, most people with ARDS will go into pulmonary edema. So we're talking about what, what is ARDS? What happens? We have a profoundly hypoxic patient with ARDS. And we're gonna go through the different disease processes. One of the things is that decreased pulmonary compliance with stiff lungs. Remember we talked about that. We've got to have lungs. Okay, so let's pause here for just a minute while I'm, while I'm thinking about it. What is your impetus to breathe? What is it that makes your brain trigger your next breath? What's going up? that says to your brain, hey, your brain says to your body, hey, CO2. breathe, your CO2 levels are rising. Okay, that's what, that's what our brain is responding to that triggers our next breath. So I've got to have a, a brain that's a, able to detect the rising CO2 levels. How are my lungs expanding? Under what pressure mechanism are my lungs expanding? Negative pressure. What does that mean? What do you use in your house that has negative pressure? A vacuum. A vacuum. Good job. Isn't it? So it's a sucking action. I mean, think about it. You're not walking around with a hose forcing air into your lungs, are you? There has to be a mechanism in here that allows for the lungs to expand because it kind of pulls them down, draws them down. That's that negative pressure that's maintained in that pleural space. Okay, so that's what's helping my lungs expand. My diaphragm goes down, it comes back up during the expiratory phase, and my rib cage comes back, goes back together, and we exhale. Okay, so there's my physiological process that controls that respiration. If a patient has a disease process that causes them to have ever so steady rising baseline CO2 levels, at some point the brain becomes desensitized to the CO2. I will use my dog as an example here, my sweet Sam. You know, I live down in the wooded area, you can't see my house from the road, and we have deers constantly. My husband and the deers, he, he gets frustrated with them because they eat his beloved plants. I'm like, baby, we just don't need to buy any more of those. It's just buy the things we know they don't like. Because he wants to put these things outside. I'm like, no, I want my deers to eat, they're hungry, they come munch whatever they want. I'm an animal lover, anyway. But we do have a really, big garden flowers and all this thing. Well, the deer's come in the yard and if Sam's on the back porch, he'll look at them and he used to bark and get all upset and go try to chase them. Now it's comical, I've got it on video. I've got absolutely on video. He'll look at them, boof. They'll look at him like, yeah. And they go right on back bunching. <laughs> it's comical. They're desensitized to each other. They know he's old and he might get off the back porch and he's going, like, <gasps> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we got you, buddy. We're going to run. We got, we got a head start. And it's funny, but they're both, not both, there's multiple deer. They're all desensitized to each other. They've quit reacting to each other, okay? When the brain senses ever so slightly increasing basic, base, uh, baseline CO2 levels, it becomes desensitized. It's like... Uh, it doesn't listen to the rising CO2 as the trigger for the next breath. Instead, what's the brain going to listen to? That's right. In oxygen levels doing what? Dropping. Dropping. So your COPD patient, particularly your pink puffer, and there's a little diagram in here in the course, your pink puffer, your blue bloater. Your pink puffer's your emphysema patient, okay? They've got the barrel chest. Um, they have a very hard time getting rid of their CO2 and they have this overall pink rosy appearance because of the retained CO2. That patient, their stimulus to breathe is that dropping PaO2 level. So if I fix that level by putting them on more oxygen, what am I telling the brain? 
Yeah, don't do anything. We got this. That's why you don't do aggressive oxygen therapy when they're in their normative state. Okay. You know, 88, 89 SAT for a chronic COPD patient, whatever, we're happy. Now, if the patient's in a crisis, we never withhold O2. Okay? Never. Um, you wouldn't look at the patient and say, well, I don't want to give you any oxygen because it might make you not breathe. Well, well they're, they're about to stop breathing anyway, so let's go ahead and do that, okay? All right? So you, you don't withhold it in a crisis, okay? But So we need to understand how the brain responds. What do we need in our alveoli to keep them expanded? What's that substance called? Surfactant. surfactant. Okay, so here's one of our big problems with this patient is they have a decreased surfactant production. So we're going to start having a lot of collapsed alveoli. And instead, because of ARDS, is an inflammatory process. What did we learn about inflammation? What, what can fluid do now that it couldn't do before? It can shift to places it wasn't permitted to go before because now we have cell wall permeability changes. So we went from the screen to the chicken wire. And we have now big bugs that can enter spaces whereas before they were kept out. So we have larger molecules that can enter spaces it couldn't enter before. So now we have lungs filling with fluid. Whereas before, they were checked and balanced, okay? Um, so the, the chest x-ray becomes whited out, if you will. So what causes ARDS? Injury to the lungs, in a nutshell. The lungs have been injured. Now there's multiple causes of those injuries. We have direct injury, in other words, the lungs have a direct injured effect or we can have a like secondary indirect injury okay so you've got to listen to some different things here so isn't it true that if a patient has pneumonia the lungs are injured themselves mm -hmm. it isn't it true that if a patient goes into septic shock because we have poor perfusion to the lungs there's indirect injury okay so these are just some examples of some different things have y'all ever seen a patient have a blood transfusion reaction mr money have you ever seen one in your career no. i've seen one that was all I needed to see. And I was given the blood. This patient had had, I think we were on our 23rd unit of blood over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, he was really, really sick. See, see you there too, I'll tell you where I was. Um, so I'll never be as long as I live. Now don't laugh when I tell you we used glass thermometers, because we did. But we had recently transitioned from the glass ones to the little electronic ones that beep, okay? So we were proud of those. But I had initiated my transfusion, and I had gotten my vital signs before. I was super anal. Everything's going to be done right or it wasn't going to happen, okay? So I'd done everything I needed to do beforehand, gotten all my vital signs, I initiated my transfusion, and I even left the room. And went ahead and got my few moments later, I went ahead and got a temp. Just, just, let's just see, even before my first set. Stuck that thermometer in my mouth and looked at it and thought, what the heck, this can't be right. It had spiked in a few minutes. And I looked, by now my patient's shivering like, oh, oh, this is a transfusion reaction. <laughs> I remember Miss Rogers told me, stop the transfusion. So that's exactly what it did. Stopped it, disconnected it from my patient, and went through our protocol and policy, okay? And that's exactly what he had. And if you ever have one, you'll, you'll find out that everything goes to the lab, your tubing and all. Okay, so don't be throwing it in the trash can. And the patient, what had happened is they have an antibody reaction. When you have multiple transfusions, each time you get a transfusion, you're, you're getting antibodies. And at some point, they're all gonna fight each other, and that's what happens, okay? So if you've ever seen one, it is, it's, it's pretty scary. It is amazing how fast vital signs will change. Tim, I was like shocked how fast that happened. So here we have indirect injury to the lungs, don't we? We have an antibody war going on essentially in the body. So just an example of some different things that can cause your patient to develop ARDS. But in a nutshell, they all cause one thing, injury. So what is medicine going to do? Once again, what caused it? Was it a motor vehicle accident that left a lot of trauma to the lung tissue? Or was it an infectious process? Is it septic shock? What is it? What's caused this patient to have injury to the lungs? Because that's how we know how to treat it then. Steroids. Because of the injury to the lungs, there's an inflammatory process that's taking place. So how can we kind of minimize that um, effect of that inflammatory process? Steroids, surfactant, because we've already said they don't have enough surfactant anymore. And we need those alveoli to remain open. Diuretics, we're gonna keep that fluid off the lungs. 
I'm going to defer all the ventilator settings to the ventilator discussion. Okay? Um, and this is, again, one of the things that we tend to forget about. They've got to have proper nutrition. Quan, you did a dysfunctional ventilatory weaning concept map. Mm -hmm. What is one of the priority interventions in order for a successful weaning attempt to take place? What does this patient need? That's exactly right. One of the number one reasons for failure to wean is inadequate nutrition. Your diaphragm has to be fed. It has to work. It has to have the strength to work. So we need to institute that nutrition within 24 to 48 hours. Doesn't that remind you of our shock patient? Let's get that nutrition on board. Okay. Your dietitian will look at what your patient's caloric needs are. What's that term they're using, Mr. Money, when they're starting to... They determine their base, and you build on it. What was that called? Dang it. Totally. This is going to... Yeah, it's, it's, it's with the calories, but as they... There's a word they're using right now, but they'll... You're... Don't tell you something like goal. I couldn't think of that word. Well, if they're doing, like, two feeding, then they'll give you... If they're starting it, they'll be like, we're going to start it at 15 mils an hour, and your goal set is... That's it, goal. <laughs> like, I was like, goal is some big old complicated word. Goal. <laughs> Dang. That, that, what they're doing is they're not going to like, okay, we're just going to onboard all this right away. Let's see how the stomach tolerates this. Let's see how the GI pro system processes it. And they'll start lower. And then they're going to aim towards whatever the goal is for that patient. It'll be specific to the patient's physiological caloric needs. Okay? Um, what's the preferred method? Enteral or TPN? Parenteral. Enteral, always. When do we use parenteral nutrition? When we cannot use the GI tract because it's either not working or there's a mechanical obstruction. That's it. Why is enteral preferred over parenteral? Because the body knows what it needs. It does a better job utilizing and storing nutrients. And it keeps the gastric, the GI tract in function. Okay, that's exactly right. It keeps the GI tract moving like it's supposed to, and it knows how to store and utilize those nutrients better than a pump does. Okay? So parenteral is not going to be preferred. It's going to be when we can't use the GI tract. So what am I going to do again? Psychological support. They are very, very scared. Okay? They really are. We're going to be calm, we're going to stay at the bedside with them, we're going to monitor their physiological responses, and we're going to just explain gently what we're doing, okay? No complicated things, that just scares people. Just some lingo they understand. This is going to pull the water off of your lungs, okay? Make your, help, help your kidneys get rid of it, okay? Whatever. Um, you may see that for our really hypoxic patients that we're going to prone position them. Now, Trust me when I tell you we were prone position patients before COVID. Okay? This isn't a COVID thing. Prone position has been in play for a long time. But what is the premise behind prone positioning? How's that benefiting my patient? You know this heavy stuff sitting on top? If you put your patient on the back, we allow for better function of the lungs. There's nothing laying on it. Right, Josh? Yeah. Josh was getting it out of there. You were doing good. Okay, when you flip them over, there's nothing else back here but long. Nothing laying on it. Okay? And it allows for better expansion, better gas exchange. That's why we prone position them. Um, don't even worry about this. Just, just totally ignore that. Okay? Sometimes, because of our, like our CO2 retainers, we'll allow them to have a little higher levels of CO2 than we would like to see. But, I mean, that's in that true at baseline of a patient who's not on ventilator that has a chronic. CO2 retention issue, okay? Don't, I don't worry about that. All right, so everybody okay with our pulmonary edema? Where are the fluids at? What are the causes of it? Um, we've got two different pathways we're going. Is it cardiac? Is it non-treatment um, of the two different patho pathophysiological causes? And don't forget, your ARDS patient is most likely going to develop pulmonary edema and almost always ends up intubated, okay? All right. Now we're going to move into fluid in a different space. And this is why I said the other day, I hope that you were reviewing and anatomy and understanding what's where, okay? Because then when you, when you assess a patient, it makes sense. And then when you get those orders to implement things, it makes sense. 
So now we're talking about a, an accumulation of fluid within the pleural space. Some different things. Because heart failure tends to, and, I, and I'm not going to get into the complexity of this, but there's an inflammatory process that goes along with that constant heart failure that can cause fluid to start building in that area. Plus the changing pressures within that space can cause it to fill. I'm not going to touch on that. I just want you to understand that this is, I personally, as, a, as for safety concerns, when you've got a heart failure patient, you need to be monitoring for pulmonary edema, okay? Pleural effusions can happen, but pulmonary edema is going to be the priority. Now, tuberculosis. So in other words, what TB, neoplastic tumors, PEs, and connective tissue diseases all have in common is we have an inflammatory process. Essentially, what's going to happen here, okay? Now, the problem with that inflammatory process is just like that blister on your heel, fluid starts to build to try to protect an injured area, doesn't it, like the blister does. You've got an injured area of tissue. Now we've got encapsulated fluid, which is called an effusion. So if I said a patient had a pericardial effusion, where's the effusion? Mm -hmm. Around in the pericardial sac, that's right. So if I say the patient has a pleural effusion, where's the effusion? Mm -hmm. The encapsulated fluid is in the pleural space, okay? So you see here on the picture here. It can be different characteristics, clear blood, whatever. That's, any type of fluid on your body can be different characteristics, right? Depending on the cause of those. Um, but you can see here on the picture, so before we even advance this, I just want you to look at this for a second, and let's just, just think through it. If you were, remember, inspection precedes auscultation. So if I'm inspecting this patient's chest rise and fall, what might I see as an aberration from normal here? That's right. I would expect that if I'm looking at this patient, this is their left lung and this is their right lung, right? I'm looking at them. So is it their left lung that's going to rise higher or the right lung that's going to rise higher? The right. So let's get some terms clear real quick here before we go any further. When we're, when we're saying something is A, we know there's a without symmetry, so symmetrical. Asymmetrical simply means, in layman's terms, not equal. So if I said my patient's um, upper um, quads were asymmetrical, their upper, upper legs were asymmetrical, what am I saying? I'm saying one is larger than the other, right? If I said chest rise and fall is asymmetrical, I'm just saying that one is rising further than the other, okay? Whereas if I said paradox, what does the word paradox mean? Opposite. Opposite. Now, if I were to say the chest rise and fall is paradoxical, what am I saying? I'm saying that instead of rising during inspiration, I'm seeing one air sink, one side sinking in during inspiration. And when I exhale, I see it doing the opposite. I'm seeing opposite inspiration it rises, expiration it deflates. I'm seeing the opposite effect happen. Now not, and be careful with this, I, and I, I know I hear nurses say the same thing, that this is not true, technically. The paradox isn't within the other side of the chest. The paradox is within that side. So yeah, it's unequal to the other side, but that's, not what we're referring to when we're talking about the paradox. We're saying this side should rise during inspiration and instead it is dropping. And during exhalation, it is should be dropping and it is rising. That's the paradox, it's within that side. Now it creates a seesaw effect on the chest, okay? So make sure you, you really understand your terminology. So asymmetrical, we're just saying that this side is not gonna rise as high as this side. What would you expect to detect on auscultation of that patient's left lung at the base? Mm -hmm. Either absent or diminished breath sounds. The only way for you to hear breath sounds is for air to be going through those passageways. Well, there's a collection of fluid here. No air passing through that. Now, is the fluid in the lung? The fluid is below the lung. So how is that affecting the function of the lung? What's the lung not able to do? Expand. Fully expand, that's exactly right. Okay, if I were, and this would be one of the situations that would warrant percussion. What would I expect to detect when I percuss that left lower base? It's dullness, there's a density there as compared to the rest of the lungs, it sounds more hollow. Like it's 
Like if you're looking for a stud in your wall, you do like my husband and do dip, 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 or you can do like me and buy a little stud on her. Yeah, that's what I got. And then he wanted to play one toy. I was like, <laughs> but if I'm looking for a stud, I can go along the wall and find the, the dense area. I'm like, okay, there's a the stud. When you're when you're percussing a patient's lungs, you'll you'll detect that difference because that fluid is dense and will be denser than the tissue which air passes through. And so you'll know there's something there. What is that? Okay. So make sure you're you're good with understanding your differences on your what you're going to detect. Okay. So we understand tachypnea aurea, we understand the compensatory mechanism. Um, this is where you get to do those cool things you learned in 103 and rarely ever get to observe. That egophony. Have your patients say E. What well, does it sound like? It's like an A. Okay. Tactile chromatis, etc. Your patient, because it's there's um, an inflammation that's causing the diffusion, usually has pleuritic pain. Do you know what I mean when I say pleuritic pain? Sharp, stabbing. I can't take any breath because it hurts when I try. Okay, pleuritic type pain. All right. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to look at, do we have adequate gas exchange with this pleural effusion? It depends on the size of it, okay? Um, is it impeding lung expansion to the point that we have compromised gas exchange? It takes pretty big pulmonary, I mean, excuse me, pleural effusions to do that. But it can happen. Um, is our airway patent, you know, blah, 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 we know that stuff. Now, treating underlying cause, what caused this inflammatory process here? If it's a neoplasm, do we, does this patient not need some chemotherapy or surgical intervention or hospice care at this point? Um, you know, we're looking at what caused that area to become inflamed that we need to treat. How do we treat that? Okay. They may have to have a thoracentesis. So the suffix Synthesis means what? We pull fluid off of something. So if I had arthrocentesis, where we, what have we done? Taking fluid off of a joint. Okay. If I have a paracentesis, what have we done? Taking fluid off of the belly. So a pericardiocentesis, pericardial sac, y'all remember that from the tamponade? And here I have a thoracentesis. So where are we taking fluid off? Plural space. They'll go in the posterior aspect of the lungs, patient will bend over, they'll put a large truck car in there, and they'll drain the fluid. I've seen a liter and a half come off of one side. Imagine a liter and a half off of one side. The patient has immediate relief. They're like, oh, I can breathe, because now the lung can expand. Sometimes the patient's not a candidate for a thoracentesis. What would be a situation where a patient would be like, no, don't need to put that big old trocar in that bag of that chest? What Good job. Mm -hmm. This might answer for you. <laughs> patient who is, who's got a high INR, elevated INR, elevated PTT. This is not an uncommon thing to happen to your post-op cardiovascular patient. Your lung, I mean your uh, valves and your bypasses, this is almost a, it's kind of going to happen because everything's been inflamed in there. And they're often not candidates for thoracentesis just because they're being managed with anticoagulants. So sometimes they'll just let the inflammatory process subside. The body will absorb the fluid. They manage the patient with oxygenation and support them and give it some time. But then there's situations situation where they have to have the thoracentesis to get the fluid off. Um, remember your job, whenever we're taking something out of the body, I don't care where the fluid comes from. You're probably going to have to do something with the fluid, so don't go discarding it down the toilet and flush it. Okay? Make sure you're responsible and you follow through and ask, do you want this in for cytology, CNS? What do we need to do with the fluid? Okay? Because they, they'll most likely want samples of that fluid sent off to the lab. Don't just go flushing it. And so you know what, what needs to be done. Your job is to make sure it's labeled appropriately doesn't get mislabeled with somebody else's name, whatever, okay? And then follow it up potentially with a chest tube. We'll, we'll do chest tubes on Tuesday. So um, if I'm looking here, and I'm, you know, you can, it's, it, you know that if you listen to lung sounds here, they'd be clear. I, I wouldn't expect anything here. And this side's pretty clear here, but then all of a sudden down here, I'm going to hear diminished or absent breath sounds. Why? Because there's no air exchange here because there's no lung expansion here. And I would expect on percussion, 
to, to have that dullness here. And of course, my very first step when I looked at the patient's chest, I didn't see that symmetrical rise and fall. Okay. All right, we're switching gears a little bit, and we're going to go to the vascular space. Okay. Pulmonary embolus. What is the primary cause of a pulmonary embolus? Okay, first of all, what's the difference between thrombus and an embolus? One's got legs. Which one has legs? Well, it doesn't really have legs. It travels. It's a traveler. The embolus is a traveler. Oh, that. The embolus is a traveler nurse. The, em the thrombus is the stayer nurse. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Worked for me. Your thrombus is stationary. Your, your, your embolus is a thrombus that has broken off and is traveling. Okay? What's the primary cause we said? Of an, of an embolus? DBT. DBT is one of your primary. Now we can have things like atrial fib, what have you. But your one of your primaries is a DBT. What's the DBT stand for? The vein thrombosis. Correct? Okay. So how can a vein turn into something in the arterial space? If it's in the leg, where's it gonna where's it gonna go if it breaks off? How's it going to enter the heart? Okay, but, but what chamber? Right atrium. To the right ventricle, and from there it goes to the pulmonary arteries. Correct? Okay. So make sure you go back and review that so you, you really understand it. Now, these, these, there are some other things. When I was a new graduate, fatty emboli were the best, been the thing. Okay, we had um, a pretty high mortality rate associated with fatty, fatty emboli, which you rarely see today. And why is that? Because we are so much better at mobilizing people when they have long bone fractures. Okay, a fatty embolus is predominantly coming from a long bone fracture. Um, they were immobilized in those days for longer periods of time, and that created these fatty emboli, and they tended to to have that when we get them up finally move them they would have a fatty illness and, and not survive. Um, air. I don't, I don't care what anybody else doesn't worry about. I know what I worry about as a nurse. I realize it is a small amount of air that actually can cause an embolus in a patient from your IV tubing. Why are you going to do it in the first place though? Are you seriously going to sit there and measure how much air you can put in that tubing? I'm not. I don't want any air in my tubing. Um, balloon pump perforation, bad day, okay? Those are things where we can cause those air emboli. Be careful with your tubing. Don't worry about what super nurse is doing. You take care of what you know is right or wrong, okay? And then we have the foreign bodies, right? Like when you're putting in an IV and you shear off a piece of a catheter because you don't recognize that. You cannot see that thing you just sheared off. So who are the people at risk? Well, we, we already said our immobilized patients, smoking, but people who smoke, why do people who smoke, why are they at higher risk? Okay, we have vascular issues already, but it does tend to cause there to be more like, I hate to use this word sludge, but it does. It changes the viscosity. Okay? Um, obesity, what do obesity and pregnancy have in common with each other in relationship to a DVT? Or the pressure on the vena cava. Decreased venous return. Um, trauma, we've got multiple injuries, and so we've got lots of clots going on, right? And then you've got the same thing with your post-op patient. And with your post-op and your trauma patient, they also tend to be less mobilized, so it's, it's really complicated. Your oral contraception patient, today, with our doses with oral contraception, it's not as bad as it used to be, it's still a risk, but it's not like it was when I was a young person, okay? Um, <coughs> but our doses were much, much higher those days than they are today. And then if they've already had a history of a DVT, guess what? Those risk factors were there then are probably there now. And so they're going to be at a higher risk again. Okay? So again, analyzing who's the patient that's at risk for a DVT. So what are we going to do about them? Get them up, get them up, get them up. Move, move, move. If they're laying in their bed, try to keep them from crossing their legs. And ex you guys, don't just tell them, don't cross your legs. Tell them why. A, the adult learner is a need-to-know learner. If you're not giving them buy into it, they're not going to do it. Okay? So tell them why. Why do we need that? Um, we know that our mechanical 
prophylaxis is SCDs. What does SCD stand for? Sequential, Sequential compression devices. Whose responsibility is it to make sure the patient has those on? The RN, the nurse, person in charge of the patient. If you delegate that to a tech to go get them, and they get busy, they're getting doing something else, and four hours go by, and they're still not on. Is it your responsibility or the tech? It's yours. Now I can delegate to a tech to go get them, but it's my responsibility to follow through, and make sure that they've been obtained and that they're done. Okay? You can't blame your tech for because you didn't get your SEDs. Um, and of course, healthy weight maintenance and, and helping our patients with blood cessation. So, how is this patient going to appear? Has anybody ever seen a patient with a, with a P? Scary. Um, the last, my, the, the last big one I, that we had was had a group of two or two students on the floor, and this was a post-op um, cabbage patient with a long, prolonged, poor recovery course. Big man, and you know, very reluctant to get up out of bed. Uh, well, it just, he, was, he just had a difficult recovery course. Anyway, my students took the tray in there and took the tray in there for the wife as well. I'm just get, I'm, I'm doing this for a purpose to give you an appreciation of how fast it can happen. And so she had her guest bedside table this way and his bedside table this way. Um, she and the student helped him sit up on the edge of the bed. And you know, she's got her little guest tray right here with her cup of coffee, because that's what she liked with her evening meal. And this was an evening clinical. And she proceeded to cut his baked potato up, because you know, he can't cut up his own. She's cutting it up. She's being, that's okay. She's being a, a, a good wife, okay? She's taking care of her, her loved one. That's her business. She's cutting it up. She's, she turned to get her cup of coffee, to take a drink of her cup of coffee. And when she turned back, he was off on the other side of the bed. And that was it. Called the code. He was a PEA. Never got him back. That's how fast a PE can boom this lodge and here we go. Okay. Sometimes you got some a little bit of time. You know, the patient has suddenly become very panic stricken. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please don't tell them that they're breathing. Okay, because you're gonna see their chest rise and fall. You're gonna see that. That doesn't mean that they're breathing. Yeah, the mechanics are intact. The lungs are expanding, negative pressure's intact, rib cage is moving, diaphragm's moving, but we don't have perfusion. Why? Because where is it sitting? Well, when it entered, and it entered, and it entered, and it lodged itself here, what do I have to have to the lungs to adequately exchange gas? I have to have perfusion. So that's exactly what they're gonna say. Can't breathe, can't breathe. Don't sit there telling me, your chest is rising and falling. Don't do that, you're just making it worse, okay? Assess your patient, get your vital signs right away, because what's one of the, other than the tachypnea and tachycardia, which is gonna be the, the intrinsic sympathetic stimulation, what vital signs gonna change pretty quickly? Blood pressure, and what is it gonna do? It's going to drop. Why would blood pressure drop? What the heck does this have to do with blood pressure? Because in order for blood flow to return to the heart, it has to have a passage way to do that. What's blocked? So then we have lower volume entering the ventricle and lower volume coming out. So hypotension. Yes, SATs are going to drop. Okay, that's that's, that's part of that gas exchange problem. They're going to drop profoundly. The patient's going to be really, really hypoxic. But that blood pressure is your tattletale. Okay, so your patient's going to have that I'm dying, and they're right. They're going to be panicked. You you know intrinsically when something's very wrong. Okay, you, you're going to know. Um, depending on how long, if they've got multiple small diffuse PEs, um, they can, they can survive that. So they're they're pretty scared during that time, but we continue to support them with oxygenation, fluids, etc. And you're going to start seeing that hemoptysis, which is just where those little vessels are starting to break down now, okay? And you're going to hear the crackles from the inflammation now through the lungs and all this other stuff here. But in the beginning, you have a very, very hypoxic patient who becomes profoundly hypotensive, okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to find out what it is. Let's, let's figure it out. 
Y'all remember the rhythm P E A that I just used? I, I talked about just a second ago. What does that mean? Pulses, electrical activity. So you hook them up to the monitor, and it looks like they've got a. They're, they're not being sinus even. The ventricular, sinus, whatever. What must I do to confirm that I have to have to check a pulse? Why would I check a carotid or femoral instead of a peripheral? Because if it's going to perfuse and I don't feel it here, then we have a problem. Okay? Because this is the last two places you won't feel it anymore. All right? So they're going to do a, a different diagnostics if the patient's stable enough to go through this. Uh, spirals, the pulmonary angiogram is your gold standard. That's the one that's going to tell us for sure what we've got going on, but got to be stable enough to get there. Spiral CT is what we use very commonly. Spiral CT. What does a D dimer tell me? It tells me there's the presence of a clot. Doesn't tell me where. Just says, hey, got some clots going on here. The VQ scan is looking at what is this mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. Got you. That's all that. What is the mismatch between ventilation and perfusion? There should be an effective team together. Okay, so your VQ scan, your spiral CT, or some of your your um, frequently used diagnostics. Okay, I think the others go without. Okay. Unfortunately, at this point, there's not a lot we're going to be able to do for this patient. And that's, the, that's why we want to prevent this. Okay. So, medicine's going to say, okay, what can we do to promote out the optimal gas exchange? You know, monitoring the AVGs, what have you. IV fluids to try to optimize cardiac output right now. We're trying to get as much fluid going, getting back to the heart as possible. Um, they can control, let us, let's do this. Is an anticoagulant going to do anything to the existing PE? No. What, then why would they order an anticoagulant? What is it going to do? It's going to prevent more or this one from getting bigger. But it's not going to treat the existing clot. What type of drug do I need to degrade an existing clot? A thrombolytic. Okay, but aren't there some criteria a patient has to meet to receive a thrombolytic? Well, we identified that frequently the patient who's subject to a DVT is a patient who just had surgery. They're not candidates for, for this. So it's not very common that we have a patient who's actually a candidate for a thrombolytic. Okay, why wouldn't they be a candidate for a thrombolytic? Because they have all kinds of wounds everywhere, and now we're going to break all those clots open. It's not specific to the clot. They might be able to go in um, and do a vascular procedure and extract that clot with a, like a basket and a net and then leave a mesh net in place so those people from LJ Clinjack can make sure you get sued later. No more. Whatever. Um, SCDs, and then morphine. Again, remember that decreased work of breathing, that anti-anxiety effect that it also has for your patient, okay? So my job as a nurse is to not let it happen in the first place. Teach my patient. Is it ever going to hurt my patient? You know, we, we have no signs and symptoms of a DVT right now, but is there anything wrong with you telling my patient who tends to be in the bed a little longer than I like them to be to, to move, to do some ankle pumps? On every commercial, let's do some ankle pumps. Every commercial, do some knee bends, right? I mean, that's good for them, right? Is that going to promote venous return? It's going to help them prevent some orthostatic hypotension? Keep that muscle action moving. I can I can teach my patient that. Do I have to have a physical therapy order to do range of motion? No, no I can do that by myself. I don't need that. You're going to do all these things that you're going to minimize the risk, okay? We need pharmacological prevention, such as what? What's the drug we use for pharmacological prevention of DVTs? Everybody's given it. Lovinox. Do you get rid of the little nitrogen bubble in your Lovinox? No. No. What's the purpose of the nitrogen bubble? Keep it in. To kind of help seal that in, okay? Can I measure my dose of a low nut? It's like maybe it's a 100 milligram syringe. Can I measure how many units to give out without expelling the nitrogen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can invert it. It's got measurements where when you invert it and the nitrogen bubble goes up, you can actually read the size of it and dispel your drug down. Okay, be careful. I had heard somebody one time say, so well, you just pull back and get more. You go out to the tire and suck some nitrous oxide. <laughs> That's not going to get nitrogen back in your syringe. Okay? All right. Do you engage the safety while it's on your patient's skin? 
Okay, before you answer, let's use some clear, critical thinking. When you've given Lovenox, do you massage the site? No. No. Why? Because you can actually cause those little tissues to bleed, whatever, right? Now, answer my question. Do you engage the safety on the patient's skin? No. If you see nurses doing this, you, 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 not in front of the patient, don't freak the patient out. But as soon as you step out of the room, it's going to be big. You do not engage the patient of the safety while it's intact with the patient's skin. Y'all know that, right? If you don't, don't you don't. You're not done. You know now. The, you, you, there's a reason it's hard to clip for that safety. There's a reason for that. It's to prevent you from accidentally engaging the safety while it's still touching the patient. You give your drug. You're going to meet that resistance at the end. Like, okay. You remove it from your patient's, you know, counter pressure, remove it, and then moving it away from you towards a trash can or wherever you engage your safety. Not like this. Peep. You don't want no head run floating around your eyeball that was left in that syringe down towards us. Okay, everybody good, right? Mm -hmm. You make sure you educate your peers. I've seen this done so many times in clinical, it's, it's quite, quite upsetting to me. You're causing injury when you do that, aren't you? You're doing the same thing as you might as well go and massage it while you're at it. <laughs> okay, don't do that. Professionally, politely, educate your peer. Do not engage in safety while it's on the patient's skin. Okay? It actually says that on the instructions. Um, anxiety management, again, again, they're so scared, guys. They're really, really scared. And then uh, looking for those complications, particularly the hypotension and the hypoxia. All right, Let's see if we can answer this. So before we proceed to the second part of that question, which value is grossly abnormal? 52 is way on out there, isn't it? 22 ballpark, usually where we're seeing the baseline. Um, so what would we anticipate the administration of? That's right, for big salt bay. All right, blunt chest force trauma. Um, this is gonna, now through some of these slides, you're gonna see me kind of go cream, cream, moving right along, because they're kind of all, in a nutshell, the same thing. But when we have blunt force chest trauma, it can be a result of anything that would cause, not sharp, but blunt. It could be a pitcher on the mound who just pitched that ball and that, that person that batted just struck it right on back to that chest at 90 miles an hour. Okay, that would be blunt force chest trauma. Domestic violence issue where the wife got stomped on in the chest or the partner got stomped on in the chest. Okay, so there's anything, something that hit that chest with a blunt force of injury. What is that going to cause? What is a contusion in layman's terms? A bruise. A bruise. Okay, we're going to bruise the lungs. Okay, when you hit something, a corner of a leg or arm or whatever, are you going to see a bruise right away, guys? No. It takes some time. So to begin with, you're like, that sure hurts for nothing to look, nothing to be but in time, all of a sudden, here comes that big old bruise later, okay? Because it takes time for those vessels to be damaged and for that blood to seep into the tissues. And then because we have an intact hemostasis system, it stops bleeding and it limits its size, okay? If I were on some anticoagulants, it's going to take longer for that hemostasis to occur, and so I'm going to have a larger bruise. Now, a bruise easier, okay? So when the patient first comes in, they may not have any clinical findings yet. Everything may look okay. But we know that before we discharge this patient, that we're going to teach them to come back if you feel short of breath, starting to have a harder time catching your breath, etc. Okay? And we're we're going to listen for signs of blood collecting on the lungs. Medicine, again, we're going to make sure we've got adequate ventilation and oxygenation. Nurse, why would I monitor CVP? And what is CVP going to do if this patient has a actively bleeding area? CVP is going to go down. So monitoring CVP would be really important for this patient. I'll talk about people when we get there. So 
with that type of trauma, we can have um, rib fractures. When we say benign, we're not saying that they don't hurt. They hurt. But when, we, when we're using the term benign, what we're trying to say is they may not be life-threatening. But there are some situations where they become life-threatening. One of them, if you have um, root, y'all need a, y'all need a break? Y'all need to go pee pee? All right. 9.35, come back. I'll let y'all have one break. Oh, I don't know if you've got the sign.